Hello lovely people, I'm Kathy and welcome to my channel. Um, I want to show you a project I've been working on since last oh, August, September time. And this is for my exhibition with the group that I'm in called CQ West, which will be in the Three Stories Gallery in Nailsworth, Gloucestershire, from the 30th of April until the 12th of May. And I'll put the details for that in um, the description box below if any of you are in that area, it'd be lovely to see you. Um, this project is called, or I call it, um, Understories, Ghost Stitching the 13 Acre Wood. Um, and the 13 Acre Wood is, is my woodland. And I made um, 13 little book forms of different kinds back in August. And then I've treated them all in different ways, um, with leaves from the woodland, with plant materials. I've stitched into some of them. Um, I've rust put rusty bits in and so on. They're all made from old sheet, linen and cotton. Um, all the threads I use are also uh, either natural dyed or undyed. And everything is biodegradable. Um, you know, metal, plant materials, cl cellulose, cloths, and so forth. Because if I put things in nature, I like to know that if I can't or don't retrieve them, that, you know, I'm not actually littering. <laughs> okay, so that being said, I just want to talk you through them. Um, I hope they're all in shot. I've got you quite low in so that you can see the details when I start showing you the individual ones. There is actually one missing here, volume five. That is in my stream. Um, when I put it in, the stream was but a trickle. I've been down twice, one, once with my mum and once with my daughter, and I can't find it. Now, I know it's in there. I don't think it's moved. It had a big, heavy hinge wrapped in it, and it was under a big rock. It's just that the, the stream was, you know, this much water when I put it there, and now it's over my wellies nearly. <laughs> so hopefully in the summer I'll be able to retrieve that one. But anyway, that one, that's um, why there's a space there. Um, the other thing you can go and look at if you're interested, I put I made an account on Instagram, which is a public account, but there's no commenting or anything like that allowed. I hope it doesn't glare. Um, I'll also put a link. It's called Ghost Stitching the 13 Acre Wood. And if you're interested in seeing the process, I kind of took some photos along the way. For example, that is this before I did anything to it. So if you're interested in seeing, you know, before and what I dyed things with and so on, I'll try and talk you through it as I go along, but you'll find um, more details there. Uh, and also you'll find, oh, what's happened now? Uh, you know, photographs like that of um, things in situ. That was this one, where's it gone? That was this one in situ in, in one of my wild cherry trees. Um, I did put a video on Kofi a little while ago um, for my Kofi supporters, which my daughter mostly filmed of me retrieving the bundles. So if you're one of my Kofi supporters and you haven't seen that video yet, do go and have a look. So uh, just adjusting the camera a little bit. I think it's probably best if I stack them up and then work my way through them one at a time. I think I pretty much remember which one's which and what I did to what. I have um, labelled them all, can you see that? With Roman numerals, so that's volume 8. Um, and then I took copious notes of every stage of the process. Um, because to me, I mean the finished things, I just, I love them. I absolutely love them. But it was also very important, you know, the whole process of doing it and then letting nature work on them with me kind of thing. So. I shall start with volume one, start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. Uh, this little book is just a, you know, a bookie book. It was just some um, sheets stitched together with pamphlet stitch. There you see in the middle the, the stitching. And um, I did quite a lot of stitching into this one. And here, this, what I think of as a question mark, that came from, stitched into it, is there you see it reversed. It's, it's actually at the top of a coat hanger. But I found this on the ground outside the village hall where we meet, where my group CQS meets once every two months. Um, so I brought that home with me in my suitcase back to France and it went into this little book. Um, now this book is spent its few months in the Phoenix Oak, um, which is an oak tree. It was a fairly young oak that fell at one point in our home woods here, um, quite up, up near to the house. And uh, a phoenix tree is a tree that falls, but it retains a connection at its roots, and then other trunks form all along its length. 
And this, the phoenix oak is, is horizontal, but then there are all these vertical trunks of young oaks coming up. Um, so this is where this one spent its time. And I did quite a lot of stitching into this one, which is also for me part of um, my ethos really. And I think the slow stitch ethos of sort of letting go of control a little bit. So, you, you know, I spent quite a lot of time stitching and then I put it, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in, a, in a tree <laughs> through the winter to, to see what happened to it. And this had some oak leaves, <clears throat> I'm sorry, frog in my throat. This had some oak leaves bundled up in it as well. So along with the rust that's reacted with the iron. Um, and there's some seed stitching, some other little bits of cloth stitched on. There, I've washed them all. I've given them all a soak in bicarb, although that doesn't help when you leave the rusty thing in. Um, but you know they're 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 clean, unlike my hands. Apologies, <laughs> you know me and my hands. I'm sorry. I live in the country. I don't like wearing gloves. Um, so yeah, I'm just I just love what that's done to it. And if you want to see it before it went into the trees, you know how it looked. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I'd turn that off. Sorry about that. Um, if you want to see it, you know, just stitched before I put it into the tree. Again, that's on that Instagram account. And there's a rusty thing. So that's volume one. Um, volume two is a scroll. Um, and I've used some of the wool that... Oops, if I can undo it. What's happened? It's come. Something's happened. There we go. To just come on undone at the end. That's probably it's rotten through, do you see? And it my I cloth twined it. That's what I was going to say. I cloth twined it and it's um rotten at the end. So I'm just gonna tie another knot in it and call it part of the journey. I think I'll do it like that. Um this was a long strip of quite open weave cotton sheet. And into this I've stitched not all, but a lot of the botanical names. People say Latin names and the pedant in me says, mm, they're not all Latin. So I say botanical names of the, not the trees, but the herbaceous plants in the woodland. And so I just stitched them all. Just, you know, I kind of drafted an alphabet on a piece of paper with straight line stitching so that it looks kind of, you know, like, like old writing. Um, and it goes on and on. It's quite hard to show you here. Gallium moderatum. I'm sorry about that. I hope that doesn't keep happening. If it does, I'll have to stop and turn it off. <laughs> I can turn that off. That's my tablet. Excuse me. Uh, what was I saying? Uh, Gallium moderatum, yes, that's wood, Woodruff. I, um, 25 or 26 years ago, I did a two-year two um, higher national diploma in garden design at Lackham College in Wiltshire. And one of the tutors was a wonderful plantsman called Paul, who absolutely loved plants and wild plants as well, although that wasn't really part of the course. And um, from him, I just got this love for the, the botanical names. And it was him as well, actually, that started me with the, don't call them Latin names, they're not all Latin. Um, and they're like poetry, you know, they're, I just, I just love the sound of them. Um, and the advantage is now, I, I live in France, obviously the common names for plants vary between languages, but the Latin names are universal, uh, there I said it, the botanical names <laughs> are universal. So that's that scroll. And that lived, um, spent its time in the mouth of what we call the wolf stump. It's just a tree stump that's fallen that um, looks like a wolf's head. If I can do it and I remember, I'll insert a photo here. Otherwise on Instagram you'll see it. So that's volume two, which I won't wind all back up now because don't want to watch me do that, I'm sure. Um, this is volume three. Um, this is a kind of flippy out thing. These are vintage laundry buttons, so they're metal and linen. There's no plastic in them. Um, so can I show you this? Let's get a bit of room. This was kind of a flippy out. It was quite difficult to come up with 13 different book forms. Anyway, that aren't, you know, 
the same without repeating yourself does it just about all fits in so this is you know this one flips that way this one flips that way this one flips downwards and this one flips out that way out of shot <laughs> but I'll show you in a minute um, and up in our eastern woods is the, uh, the biggest oak tree we've got. Our woods are quite young, I think. The biggest oak is about 150 years old because where we live, wood is harvested for firewood and so on and you know, always has been. And also most of the woodlands in France are in private hands, so there's not much control over what gets cut down. Um, so and this particular oak, at about a yard from the ground at one point, it was damaged and it's grown four new trunks and I guess that that must have been going by the girth of the trunks maybe 60 or 70 years ago. But the main trunk is big enough to be, you know, somewhere 100, 150 years, which for an oak is still a, still a young one. Um, but anyway, I call it the mother oak because it's our oldest oak. And I read a lot about um, a project called The Mother Trees by Suzanne Simard, who's a Canadian scientist. Um, and she worked very much on the... Um, the mycorrhizae, which is the network of the fungal network under the forest, and how that connects the trees and how the whole ecosystem depends on that fungal network. Um, so I'll, I'll put a link to, to her as well, to her work. So on this piece, I stitched some of the things from her work, you know, sort of the key points, again, with the text. So trees form interconnected communities interact with their own and other species and form kin relationships with their genetic relatives. Um, I did the four, obviously, because my tree's got four trunks. Mother trees are the biggest, oldest trees in the woods with the most connections, sharing carbon through the mycorrhizal network. Uh, that one's now upside down. <laughs> uh, woods with natural connections support biodiversity, age, age regeneration, conserve carbon storage and better withstand climate change induced stress. Very important in these times. And the last one says, the old trees nurture the young and when mother trees die, they pass their wisdom to their kin, sharing knowledge of how to survive in a changing world. And what I love about Suzanne and that she's got um, TED Talks and things like that as well, if you're interested, is that she is, a, it, it's science, you know, it, it's hard evidence-based science, but she has a way of presenting it that's so, um, I don't know how to say it, that, that, that kind of touches you emotionally as well and connects you with nature. Um, and, you know, I, I've got her book, um, I think it's called The Mother Tree Project. Again, I'll put a link down below. Um, but yeah, Dr. Suzanne Simard, it's a wonderful book. It's part autobiography and part how she you know, struggled quite a lot in what was largely a man's world because she worked with, you know, with, with the lumber trade initially um, in, in bringing this project, you know, in, into the public, the public consciousness. So that's the Mother Tree project for me, represented by my mother oak um, with her four trunks. That was a volume three. I have got a crib sheet, but I'm doing okay so far. But you know, I might need my crib sheet. That's volume four, which is, and now I need my crib sheet. Volume four is chestnut, yes. Volume four is chestnut. There's a lot of chestnut in our woods and um, that's mostly what we burn because our woods have been untouched for a long time. So there's a lot of fallen chestnut. Um, so we're able to go and harvest that to burn, you know, and leave all the twiggy stuff behind for the wildlife. Uh, so, and in our little clearing here, just near to the house, there's a chestnut with a very bent trunk, and I pass it twice a day. It's the, the way in and out of the woods with the dogs. Now this I did not plan ahead, because stitched into this uh, were nine um, chestnut leaves. And obviously it's been washed and so forth, and they're in there now and it's dry. Can you see? There's actual leaf still in there. Because when you're kind of process focused, you don't plan ahead. <laughs> but you know, they're dry, they're not gonna rot or anything. They're, and you see that one's imprinted onto the outside of the, of the cloth there quite clearly. Um, so they're chestnut, tree, chestnut leaves from that tree and they're in there still. And they'll be in there until they crumble and fall out because it is open at the ends. I just did stitching roughly either side just to hold them. 
and that was bound bundled around a, a chestnut stick tied with string and that was then buried in the ground at the base of the tree. Well actually just in the hummus because there's a very thick layer of hummus there. When I say hummus I always think of the chickpea dip but you know I don't mean that, I mean you know. It would be nice if I had chickpea dip laying around in my woodlands but you know the soil based hummus, all the leaf litter and all that kind of stuff. And on the tie for this one it's not letters it's just symbols um, and it's just kind of as if it's a, a, a language without words. That was the idea of it. And the other thing I love on this tie, if you can see, I think you can. Do you see the little marks? That's from the string that bundled it around the stick. And that's, you know, the strings acted as a resist in places and in other places the tannin um, and the iron in the soil has reacted and created those marks. So this is, you know, really slow eco-printing. Really slow eco printing. It's I kind of view it as a collaboration with nature. You know, it's me and nature making art together. Well, you know, some people call it art. Other people <laughs> would call it dirty old rags. I love this one. I love this dirty old rag. This is volume six. Volume six. Um, this is just a concertina book or an accordion book. And where I wanted to define the pages, I just stitched a little pleat. So there I stitched the pleat with going that way, and there I stitched it going that way, uh, alternating all the way along. And in this, trap between each layer, um, this was the outside, so there's still metal in there, I put um, a pot mender. If you've watched the TM Rust dyeing video, you've seen me use those metal discs that were for mending metal watering cans and buckets and things. You, you put two discs with a cork in between and they've got a little hole in the middle and you, there's a little nut and bolt to, you know, block the hole in a watering can. Um, they had some in my local hardware store in England. Um, and the lovely man who worked there, Phil, who is a very, very, very tall man, um, he gave me a whole card of them. Um, I went in saying, have you got anything round that will rust? Because these days a lot of new metal won't rust and I wanted to to make resists. Um, and he came out with these pot menders. Anyway, can you see there? I hope you can see. I have to bring it to one side because the clamp means I can't see. Yeah, you can see the impression of the leaf, and that's a hazel leaf, behind the rusty ring and even the veins of the leaf. Um, and on that one as well. And here on the outside, you see there's there's still metal in there. This would not be cloth to stitch anymore or use in anything or whatever because there is rusty metal still in it, you know. Um, and here, look at that. You can really see the veins in that leaf. And this little book was um, put in a little bit lower down. Our woods are kind of in two parts because it, through the middle is a very steep valley with the stream running through the bottom. Um, and this part, the homewards, because it's near a home, um, I walk there twice a day with, with both dogs. The big dog can't get down the valley anymore to go up to the other side. But the, the, you know, the biggest area of woodland is the other side of the valley. Um, but on a little way, a little path going down, there's a hornbeam tree um, which has fallen kind of not quite a yard from the ground, so it's under an angle. And then rising up from that horizontal trunk are three other trunks, and there's a little mossy place to sit. And you can just wedge yourself in, and I can get my shoulder tucked in by one of the trunks and my back leans against another. And it's lovely to sit there, and it faces east if you sit there like that. So it's lovely when it's not hot <laughs> um, to sit there in the morning and with the sun on your face. And I often take a thermos of coffee down with me and, and sit there and, um, you know, just enjoy the birds and so on. So that hornbeam, I call it the mornbeam. That's just, you know, a lot of places in our woods have names. Um, I, I just, I've always done that since I was little. And now my children do it as well. So that is volume, I can't remember now. Is it volume six? Volume, volume six. And growing all around the mornbeam are hazels, so I put some hornbeam leaves and some hazel leaves in this. And it lived in a little hollow at the base of the where the trunk comes out of the ground. 
Um, interesting, it was tied up with string. The string I use is also obviously biodegradable. Um, and when I retrieved it, the string had completely gone, completely rotted away. So uh, this one is a tall skinny one that I just bound a single page, you know. And I used this cross stitch to bind it. And I dyed it first with um, birch leaves, silver birch, betula pendula, um, silver birch leaves. And if you then put something a little bit rusty in with it, you get this lovely olivey green colour. Um, and it's got a cover of a open weave um, cotton sheet. And then the pages are finer cotton. And onto this I did this stitching. Now this is basically blanket stitch. Um, but done in such a way to represent the trunks of silver birch. And this, uh, most of it, there's one or two silver birch this side, but most of them are the other side. And and they're kind of pioneer trees. They're, if woodland's clear, they're, they're one of the species that comes back first, you know, before the oaks and the chestnuts and so on. Um, and there's a little grove of them, almost a circular, they form a circle. Um, and I call them the silver ladies, and I kind of fancifully imagine that they're in different places when I go because they dance when nobody's watching. Um, and this little bundle spent its time tied uh, between two, where two trunks were forked of one of the silver ladies. So I did this blanket stitch, like I say, um, in different ways to represent the, the markings on the trunks. I'm sure you, if you know silver birch in your country, um, that you'll know what, I, what I'm talking about. And you see that the inner pages have kept more of the colour. None of this cloth was mordanted or treated properly in any way, which I normally would do if I was, you know, eco-dyeing to use in my, my other work. This was just, all I did with it was give it a soak in tea to give it a boost, you know, for the tannin in the beginning. Um, and then beyond that, it was just treated how it was treated. I did not do it properly. And um, there's another one. And then the back page, I did not do anything to, but it has got the volume number on it, which is volume seven. So that was the Silver Birch or the Silver Ladies, the Book of the Silver Ladies. They feel That one feels nice and nice and soft. Um, this one, volume eight, is the Wild Cherry. And we have a lot of wild cherries in this side of the woods. Again, that's a, an early tree. And I did quite a lot of words in this because I love wild cherries um, and the birds love them as well. Bird cherry is a different species. So I'm gonna get all pedantic. <laughs> this is Prunus avium or avium, which avium is from the Latin for bird. But the common name of this is wild cherry, not bird cherry. Bird cherry is Prunus, I can't remember, something else. Anyway, so this is, uh, again, pamphlet bound, but the pages in the first half are staggered. And this I trapped between, I've got some metal mesh. So this was wrapped up with the metal mesh uh, and tied up with string. And this was wedged behind one of the older wild cherries, has got vines growing up it. So I wedged it just in behind one of the vines, quite high up on the tree. Um, and because of the metal mesh, it's got some really nice rusty marks. Now I may, because there's not actual metal apart from this first page, which was on the outside, in here I might do some more stitching. I haven't decided yet. Also depends how the time goes, because I have to go to England on the 17th of March and deliver this work. Um, and then along the edges, so this you saw from the, the outside because of the way the pages are. There's some of the names, so Prunus avium and then Wild G and Bird Cherry, um, although it's not, but you know. And then something in Gaelic, which I can't pronounce. I think it's Creevshirst. It's Gaelic for Wild Cherry. And then inside I've written, or you know, written with stitching, all kinds of um, things about it. Queen of the Forest, Early Nectar for the Bees, Fruit for the Song Thrush and the Dormouse, Leaves for the Short Cloaked Moth, um, a tea made from the bark eases a cold. Resin was used by children as chewing gum. Bagpipes are made from the wood. Um, it is said that the cuckoo cannot stop singing unless he has eaten three good meals of, of cherries. 
A wild cherry walking stick prevents the user getting lost in the mist. The mother of Buddha was supported by a holy cherry tree as she gave birth. The phoenix sleeps on a bed of blossom to gain mortality. <clears throat> and this is from um, Houseman's, the Shrop a Shropshire lad. Loveliest of trees, the cherry now is hung with bloom along the bough and stands about the woodland ride wearing white for Easter tide. And then we're back to the beginning. And um, when I've been stitching these words, I didn't write them on first, I just stitched them. I did, I think, when I had a whole page like that, um, I did indeed make some very faint pencil lines just to keep me going straightish, you know. But the the words I just I just stitched with one strand of um, I think it was embroidery cotton that was dyed with madder, something of that kind. So that was volume eight. Volume nine, aha, uh -huh, a much um, that's bits of chestnut leaf coming out of that one. Uh, volume 9 um, is Bramble. This was to honour the brambles. Now this top part of our, the Homewards we only bought um, just over a year ago now. It didn't come with the house and nobody visited it for all the time that we lived here and, and for quite a few years before. And then one day we had a letter um, from a notaire, which is a French solicitor, saying that it was for sale and were we interested and it was very reasonable you know land here is not expensive and so yes we were very interested and we we were lucky enough to buy it um and when we met the man who we bought it from when we went to sign for it he said that about 15 or so 15 or 20 years ago most of the trees were cut for firewood the area was cleared and there are indeed large open areas there are one or two mature trees still or you know mature-ish like the phoenix oak which is probably about 50 or 60 years old at the most. Um, but there are big areas of clearance which have been colonised by brambles. And my instinct was to clear the brambles because it looks to my human eye as if they're choking the trees that are growing up through. There's a lot of ash, um, silver birch, chestnut and so on, growing um, hawthorn growing up through the brambles. Um, but before I did, I thought, mm, something stopped me. So I went and did some reading and um, what I discovered was that brambles and bracken as well, which we have the other side of the woods, uh, brambles are actually a pioneer plant. After woodland is cleared, they're one of the first plants to come. And, you know, nature does sort of know what she's doing if we don't meddle too much. And the brambles are actually protecting the young trees from the deer and encouraging them to push up towards the light and grow nice, tall, straight trunks. So all I've done is strim some paths through the brambles and the rest I've left. A bonus to that of course is obviously the brambles are nesting sites for birds. The wren, we have a lot of wrens nesting in the brambles. Um, little creatures like dormice and we have Loire here which is an edible dormouse is its common name which I always feel sorry for the poor little thing being known as edible. Um, and all kinds of other creatures you know there are um, snakes, uh, adders and grass snakes um, yes, I'm very careful with the dogs for adders. I walk stamping in the in the summer, so that they, if they're there basking in the sun, that they slither away. Um, and the fruit of the bramble, obviously the blackberry. We have blackberry and apple crumble galore, and blackberry pie, uh, blackberry jam, blackberry jelly. And last year, for the first time, I made bramble whiskey. Um, now, I'm not a huge fan of whiskey unless it's a really, really good expensive malt, but if you just buy the cheapest possible whis whiskey that you can find, cram a kilner jar full of blackberries um, and then t put some sugar in and top it up with whiskey. I read Leave It for a year. I made four bottles <laughs> last August and they've all gone. So, you know, we have no restraint. But it was delicious, it really was, you know, just a little tot of an evening. And obviously we've shared some with friends and so on. Bramble whiskey. Anyway, so I'm, I have learned to love brambles. They still ripple my skirts as I go by and so on. Um, the leaves are wonderful for eco-printing. And the, the, here there's always leaves. They're not evergreen, but there are always leaves through the winter. So there's always something to get. So all that long, wittery waffle, this little book was to honour the brambles. So I... Um, it's just a simple little book. Again, it's not a fold, it's just stitched, you know, single pages together 
just stitch with two lines of running stitch along the edge this rather coarse old cotton sheet. Um, it had a couple of rusty hinges and some string around it and it was um, on one of the, bram the parts through the brambles coming back up towards the house, or well, that's the way round I go usually. There's kind of a fallen, very small sapling trunk dead in among the brambles. I found it when I was strimming because I wanted to go that way and I came up against it so I had to make a detour. So there's kind of a, you know, a bend going around there. Um, so anyway, I tied this to that little, little um, fallen sapling and in the pages I trapped some bramble leaves. And um, here you see, you see, do you see, do you see, that they've, they've printed on the cloth. And that's the black and the, uh, the black is the iron tannin reaction, the same as we had with the rust and the tree, and the tea, the rust and the tea. So the tannin in the leaves reacting with the, the rusty iron. And there again you see as well. So yeah, you know, that, that thing where I read about the brambles and my instinct was, oh, they're throttling the, all the trees, I must get them all away. And you think, no, hang on a minute, they've been there for, you know, 10, 15 years like that without anybody interfering and there are trees growing. Stop, think, research. So I did. And um, yeah, now I see the brambles as friends and not foe. Doesn't mean I like them coming up in my vegetable garden, mind you. <laughs> There's a place for everything. That's all a weed is, isn't it? A weed is only a plant in the wrong place. Okay, this is, I do believe, if I'm not mistaken, the Book of Ash. I'm going to check. Yes, the Book of Ash, Fraxinus Excelsior. Ash in the UK, you just don't see many mature ash anymore because of ash dieback disease. Um, I was thrilled here when we first came to view the house and we found the secret valley, which you can't see unless you go down there because it, you know, it's steep, um, that there are three big ash trees growing where I cross the stream in the secret valley. And then further up into the woods, there are quite a few ashes and they look, there is dieback in France. I did research it. The disease is here. Um, but in our woodland, they, they seem healthy. So, you know, fingers crossed. Um, so this Fred Fred hair, sorry, uh, this little book, Again, it was blanket, it was single pages, blanket stitched along. And it's all different sheets within the one book, from all from different kinds of cotton sheets. And um, I, Ash is not a great eco printer as a rule, but I did put a leaf on here and it has printed faintly. Can you see that? Um, because it was autumn, tannin in, general the tannin in the leaves is highest in the autumn that's in general when i do most of my eco printing um, so you know i have got something maybe other people can get ash to print beautifully i can only talk about what my experience is um, and inside you sort of see the ghost prints and this the the leaves in here came from the ash trees by the stream the the most mature ash trees um, and it lived in the trunk of the boundary ash, a tr an ash tree that I call the boundary ash because it's on our western boundary, <coughs> excuse me, which is actually in the heart of the woodland. So there's, there's no fences or anything like that. You know, you just have to, we walked with GPS on my husband's phone with the coordinates, you know, the map coordinates from the cadastral plan, the, the land registry in France and sort of, you know, said, oh yeah, our boundaries here, our boundaries there. But if it's a couple of meters here or there, you know, the other side is my neighbors. It doesn't, you know, doesn't really matter. <laughs> doesn't really matter. It's not like, you know, your garden in England, if someone took a, a foot of ground from you, there'd be, there'd be a feud that would run through the generations. It's not like that here. Um, but anyway, this ash tree is definitely on our boundary next to the stream. And there is quite a lot of metal still in there, so, you know, again, it's not a cloth to be stitching into or so on. Um, and again, look on the back, the string marks, because it was bundled around a little ash stick, like that, and tied with string. So you get those beautiful string marks. So that's the Book of Ash. Uh, this one is, I can see because it's written on it, is the Book of Hawthorne. Um, we have quite a few hawthorns in the woods, lovely things, hawthorns, um, Critigus monogyna, um, the may tree, quickthorn, hawberry, thorn apple, mayflower, hagedorn or hagedorn, I'm not quite sure, 
white thorn crotigus monogyna. Um, I dyed this with the hips from the hawth you know, the fruit of the hawthorn, which is not really a dye that I'm thrilled with, and it came out a sort of pinky colour that I didn't find very pleasant, so I do what I always do. In that case, I dunked it in rusty water, um, and I got this lovely green. I did quite a lot of stitching in this, um, and these cloths were all naturally dyed. The next page I've broken my own rule, but um, this was in Hawthorns quite close to the house, tied securely that I passed twice a day, so I was fairly confident I wouldn't lose it. So those are all naturally dyed cloths. The next page has got commercial cloths, which are still all cotton. They're all cotton, biodegradable, but they've got synthetic dye in them. So normally I wouldn't leave something like that where there was any risk of it being lost. But I wanted to, Hawthorns for me kind of bracket the, the growing season in a way. Um, you know, that there's an expression in the north of England, um, <clears throat> and I think throughout Britain actually, which is ne'er cast a clout till May is out. And people think, some people, that it means the month of May. It doesn't. It means the May flower, which is the flower of the hawthorn. And a clout is an old-fashioned word for clothes. So basically it means don't take your coat off until you see the hawthorn blossom, because only then, you know, is the, the warmer weather coming. So I wanted to sort of reflect that, you know, the the autumn end of the year and the spring. And hawthorn, new hawthorn leaves are such a vivid green as well. And the smell of them, they remind me of soap. You know, if you ever smell where a washing machine's draining, that sort of soapy smell. Other people find it unpleasant, but, you know, I, I, that's what it smells to me of. So I've written A Doorway to the Other World, Home to We Folk. There's a lot of legend, um, especially Celtic legend, surrounded, surrounding the Hawthorn. Um, a sprig in the hat protects from lightning. Not tried and proven, so, you know. <laughs> Um, I said, cast narrow clout, M.A. is out. Ancestress of the Maypole, the first Maypoles, which in England we dance around to celebrate um, May Day or Beltane, <clears throat> were originally made of hawthorn. Wash your face in the dew to preserve your beauty. Obviously, I'm out there every day <laughs> in the season, as you can see when you see my face. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's a little book of hawthorn. There's another thing which exists in Ireland, I've seen them, called a clutie tree, which is a hawthorn, and people tie little rags to them. And if you have suffering in your life or pain or grief, the idea is you tie a rag to the tree, and when the rag's rotted away, your pain and your grief goes with it, um, which is a lovely idea. But sadly, nowadays, people go and tie polyester <laughs> and things like that to these things, which is not going to rot away for 500 years or more. Anyway, you know, blah. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this, aha, book, volume 12. This is the Book of Walnut. I love walnuts for eco-printing and so forth. I don't like to eat them very much. I don't mind them in cakes. Uh, my husband will eat them, and he ate tons this autumn just gone. Um, now, about uh, 200 yards from where I'm sitting is a big walnut tree, and there are two other smaller ones in the woods. And I was going to, um, my neighbour has a very small tree which doesn't have many nuts. I'm, I'm mostly interested in the husks for dyeing, you know, the green outer casing of the nut. Um, but I was going to a local um, arboretum to gather husks from the ground in the season. Unbeknownst to me, 200 yards from where I'm sitting is a huge walnut. You just couldn't see it, it was so overgrown. We never went into that woodland until we owned it because it was impenetrable. You know, I literally hacked my way in the day we signed for it from our side and made paths through. And the brambles were over my head. And I came, you know, cutting through the brambles with the help of loppers and secateurs and a, a, a strimmer. And I started seeing um, walnut shells on the ground. So I got a little bit excited. And then eventually I came into what is now a little clearing that we've made. And there's this huge walnut tree. I mean, it's enormous. And I had no idea it was there. You can't see it from the terrace. Well, you can now, but you couldn't see it, you know, from anywhere. So anyway, I was super excited about my walnut tree. I danced and whooped and hollered and, um, yeah, got very excited. So this little book was made to honour my walnut tree, one of my three walnut trees. 
Um, again, I overcut, it's just single pages overcast stitched along the edge, and I couch circles that kind of are a bit walnutty. You see here, there's a tiny little bit of moss. See that bright green? That's actually growing in the sheet. Well, it's not growing anymore, sadly, because it's all dry. Moss is very resilient. If I went and put, made that wet again, that moss would recover. I'm confident that it would. I love moss. Mosses, lichens and fungi in at some point, not, not for eco-dyeing. I wouldn't start messing with um, fungi and um, like, certainly not lichens for eco-dyeing because some are very rare and I don't know enough to know which to leave and which to take. But in terms of studying them and learning more about them, you know, fungi and fungi are obviously not plants. They're fungi. They have their own kingdom. Um, lichen are a symbiotic relationship between algae, which is a plant, and a fungi working together. Uh, mosses are plants. Anyway, I digress, as usual. So, yeah, so I couch circles, which, you know, represent walnuts to me. Um, different and I didn't draw circles or anything I just did them you know freehand and the wool that I used is was dyed with walnuts and the thread as well I believe although that looks red that's more of my madder actually that's some madder dyed silk madder is a plant that I grow in my dye garden um, in a bed on its own in a corner and it's the root that you use for dyeing and there because it's not um, very well behaved. If you let it out, it will run riot. So it's yeah in a bed surrounded by grass, which gets mowed, so it can't spread. And that was nearly the first thing I did when we moved here. You know, put the kettle on, go and plant your madder, because it's five years before you can start harvesting from seed. Um, so that's anyway. It's not about madder. It's because that's not a woodland plant. It's about this little book of walnut, and um, lucky, lucky me with my walnut tree. And I'm a poet, and I know it. And now, oh, 40 minutes, we're doing all right. Um, so this is volume 13. This was the first one I retrieved because I put it in the ground. Now, this is spruce. We have a few spruce trees up this side of the woods. There's one big one in particular. On the other side, there's a few more. And we have a few pine as well. I didn't do anything with the pine, actually. Um, European white pine. Um, but this is spruce, Picea abies, the tree that's commonly used as a Christmas tree for those people who have Christmas trees. Um, and this book I stitched again quite heavily. Again, it's just, you know, I said I tried to come up with all different kinds, but you see they're all very much very similar, except I varied how I stitched together uh, the pages. Um, different sizes and shapes, you know, I did my best. Anyway, so I stitched lots of um, circly things in here. Circle forms, vaguely circles, different kinds of stitching, blanket stitch, running stitch, this sort of radiating out stitch. I don't think that's a technical term, but you know. There's a teeny tiny little stitches in there. Um, this, you know, has a lot, a lot of work. That's actually some string couch down that had been used in eco printing. I did some stacked running stitch. I might do that in the slow stitches series at one point because that's another stitch I do like, um, which you stitch round and round and lay your running stitches one over the top of the other. And then just went, you know, it's like me on a mad hair day. Me when I've just washed my hair, which I just have. I don't wash my hair too often because it's quite fine and fly away and it doesn't need it. Um, but when I do, it's annoying for about a week and a half and before it settles down. Anyway, and in there is a rusty washer and it's stitched in there. Um, and then there's another circle on the back. And I put it in, actually in the ground, quite deep in the ground at the foot of the, the spruce. And then I started getting worried because I hadn't really put them in the ground before. And so I dug it up, um, I can't remember exactly when, but a, a month or two later. So, but I could have left it longer, and if I had longer, I might put it back because you know it's still, its its covers have taken a bit of a something that's been nibbling or they've just rotted away. Um, but yeah, it was volume thirteen. It was the first one I took out. Um, so that's it. That's my thirteen volumes, um, and how I'm going to present them for this exhibition, I've given a lot of thought. 
because I would like people to be able to handle them. I'll put a warning about the rust for people with sensitive skin and some gloves, although I won't require gloves if people are happy not to. Anyway, um, I've made a journal. <laughs> I thought, what, could, what project could I choose that will really stress me out because I'll have to get it done quickly and that's not how I like to work. Um, I know, I'll make a journal. Um, <clears throat> and here it is. There's a whole series, I've filmed a whole series of videos, not the whole process because it's many, many hours, um, but showing some of the process of this. And I'm going to include those, as you see it's already fat. You can't see it all, you see it's already fat. But anyway, somehow I have to fit those into there and still be able to close it. I'm not going to do you a flip through now, I'll do that separately, um, but there's a series coming called Making the Forager's Journal, and this is me making this journal. Um, but I'll just show you it, you know, briefly. Um, I'm kind of going to start posting those in the build up to my exhibition, which, like I said, is the first two weeks of May. So the cover is, this is just a wrap, which is some borrow stitched, borrow inspired stitched, you know, pieces of indigo dye and so on. And then I had this old book, which I bought some old books for journal making from a local um, Brickant, and this, he gave it to me because it, the cover was virtually detached from the text block. But you see it's got oak leaves on it and all this lovely. And the spine was about yay thick, and now it's yay thick, and it should have been even thicker. And this was some more Fred Fred hair. Sorry, now <laughs> this was some more, um, actually the bit of the piece of burrow stitch thingy I already had, but it wasn't big enough to go around this monster. So I actually took one of my meditation scrolls, and now I'm right up in your face, but anyway, and um, took a piece of it and added it on to extend this. And then I used another piece of the meditation scroll to cover the spine. Um, and then I, it's very much in the, can I get you a bit higher? This might go horribly wrong. Don't, just close your eyes a minute. I don't want to make you dizzy. Is that better? I think that's a bit better. Now I can fit it all in, yep. Um, yeah, it's very much done in junk journal style. So I've used all kinds of recycled paper, old bits of lace. Um, in here I've included all kinds of um, words about the different trees, some pictures, which I photocopied from my European and British trees of, you know, native woodlands, photocopied them and tea dyed them and so on. And then I've let their areas for all the different volumes. That's obviously waiting to retrieve, receive the boundary ash. And there are flip outs and, you know, some of my photos that I took and so forth. So there'll be a, a series of videos coming showing how I made that here and there, little, you know, bit, sections of it, quite long, wittery ones, some of them, you'll be surprised to hear. Um, and then the last video in that series, I will, I'm aiming to post just before the exhibition opens, and that will be a full, thrip, a full flip through of the finished journal with all the little books included in it. So that was my understories project, um, ghost stitching, the 13 acre wood, ghost stitching, because it's like ghost writing, you know, like I'm the ghost stitcher and the woods does the real work, was the idea. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that, something a little bit different. Sorry, I'm now making you wobble. Um, thank you so much for watching and I look forward to you joining me next time for more Cloth Tales. Bye bye.